This is our sixth and final session, I believe, on Colossians 3, 22-4-1, and we shift from a focus directly on slaves to the ones who are their lords, that is, lords according to the flesh. Father, as we look at this, lords, grant to the slaves what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a Lord in heaven, would you show us the implications of this for our own uh, leadership and for the institution of slavery itself? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a, that's a big request, isn't it? Lords, grant to the slaves what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a Lord in heaven. Several observations. And the first one may not be obvious, but let me show you how obvious it really is. This letter is being read to the whole church, right? And in the church there are slaves, and in the church there are lords, or masters, those who according to the Roman institution, own these slaves and can do with them as they please. These lords and these slaves are now in Christ. They are united to Christ by faith. And these lords have just listened for what? A minute or two to these statements. They have listened to Paul say that, yes, the slaves are to obey these lords. And so they might be sitting there thinking, well, that's, that's helpful. Their Christianity is not going to make them uh, recalcitrant to their participation in my household. And then he hears, hears Paul say, what governs them is their fear of the Lord, not their fear of these lords or these lords. Then he hears them say, what you do, work from the soul as for the Lord, not for men. And the, the master here hears him say, don't work for this Lord. Suppose, it's, suppose the Lord's name is Jim. Not for Jim. Don't work for Jim. Work for the Lord. And the master hears that and he says, hmm, what's the implication of that? And then he hears, knowing that from the Lord they get an inheritance, which means the Lord Jesus is ranking them as his children. They are the children of the Lord of the universe, and I'm enslaving the children of the Lord of the universe. Hmm, what does that imply? And then he hears them say, you are serving as a slave the Lord Christ, underlining this. And so he hears a second time, they're not serving me, they're serving the Lord Christ. And then they are warned. So the question I have is, as this Lord takes responsibility for his household, what will he teach these slaves? What will their private devotions or, I mean, their family devotions, their household devotions sound like? This Lord will have to say, you are not serving me. You're not serving me. I'm not your Lord. Jesus is your Lord. And the only reason you are offering obedience to me is because of him. That's what he's got to say. If he's a faithful teacher and a faithful Lord of what he's heard from the epistle to the Colossians at church. He remembers that something like this has been taught probably by the Christian teachers at Colossae. He who is called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman of the Lord. He's got to say that to his servants, his slaves. You are freedmen of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when he was called is a slave. He's got to say, I'm the slave in this relationship. You're the freedman. I'm the slave. We both were bought with a price. We ought not to become slaves of men. This is what this, 
this leader has to say in his in his family household devotions. So that's my first observation. It's shaking. It's it's it shakes up the system, right? It shakes up the structure of slave and master. Now the second observation. Knowing that you also have a Lord in heaven, which is another way of saying you are a slave. In this relationship between you and this, never, never forget, Mr. Lord, you're a slave. You're a slave in vastly more indebted ways than they are because this Lord is the Lord of heaven, the Lord of earth, the Lord of the universe, and you are his slave. This has got to affect the way you relate to these other Christians called your slaves. Then, two words. Listen, lords, grant to your slaves what is just and grant to your slaves what is fair. Now, what do those two words imply? This word just, dikaion, is a very broad word. Sometimes it can be precisely defined as in jurisprudence, where something is perfectly just in that the crime fits, I mean, the, ju the punishment fits the crime exactly right, but it can be very broad. For example, here's the very word in Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So children obeying parents is right. That's a very broad word, and that's the word here, which means it's not very precise. It doesn't tell the masters with any precision what to do with these lives. But it puts a huge word on them, just right. Do what's right by them in view of everything you know and have been taught about their identity in Christ, do what's right by them. And then fair, this word can be translated uh, equal or equality. Here's a use of it in Second Corinthians. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. He's trying to make sure that the, the offering he's taking up does not feel like a burden while it's going to others and there would create some imbalance while you get poor and they get rich. Rather, but as a motive, rather as a matter of fairness, same word, your abundance at their present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need that there may be fairness. In other words, the idea of fairness in Paul's mind is that nobody is being given, being treated with favoritism. Like it's okay for one group to be gathering a great abundance at the expense of the others, or vice versa. As it is written, whoever gathered much back in the Old Testament when they were gathering manna, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. So there wasn't perfect equity, like each had the same amount, but they had what they needed. They all had what they needed. Now, what he's saying here at least would be, let there be fairness in that among your slaves, you don't play favorites and beat up one and treat the other like a child. Or perhaps the fairness means since they are all children of God and you are children of God and your children are children of God, that there should be fairness in that extent. The point is just and fair 
are very nonspecific, which raises the question, what should lords do? What should they do? And my guess is that these lords, when they thought about what had just been said here about slaves not being their slaves, but the slaves of Christ, and their being slaves of the Lord in heaven, and that they're not serving the Lord, they're serving Christ. And what we saw here of you were bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. When these lords thought on all of that, and you can think back to the first session we did on this passage in which we looked at a half a dozen texts wider than this, when these lords thought on all of that, my guess is some of them thought, this, this system of slavery owner is over. It just doesn't make sense anymore to treat these brothers and sisters as our property. And others said, yes, but Paul didn't say it's over in so many words. Now, that's the division that split America in the 1840s, 50s, the abolitionists and others who were not explicitly abolition said it just doesn't make sense, especially in the way it was manifest in America that was race based and rooted in visions of humanity that were so contrary to all humans being created in the image of God and all the other Christian impulses that were being obliterated by the slave system in America. And others argued, even as Christians, yes, but look, Paul didn't blow it up. And that's where I'm going to end and say to you, you've got to decide that. You've got to decide in leaving the shell, as I described it, the shell in place, meaning he continues to use the word slave, he continues to use the word master or lord. He does not say, it's over, folks, there are no slaves anymore, and there are no lords anymore. He leaves the shell in place, and everything he says almost blows it up, makes it unworkable. So you have to decide, do I go there and say, even though Paul didn't end the system by denouncing it per se and just say to the lords, you're done. You don't have slaves anymore. Leaving it in place. Or are you going to go and say, actually, Paul didn't provide the seeds that blew it up? gutted it from the inside, took away the very reality of one human owning another human.